Nithya Krishnamurthy, and Nithya attends Canyon Crest Academy. She's actually just turned 16, so she's one of our youngest ever scholars to attend this program, which I don't know if about you, when I was 16, this isn't what I'd be doing with my summer, so super impressive, Nithya. Um, Nithya is interested in attending either UCLA, Berkeley, Brown or Columbia, and she has great ambitions. Um, she'd like to study either immunology, genetics, or global health, and then move on to an MD, PhD. So a lot going on in the next few years. Nithya has been described as accomplished, wait, these are my words. Nithya has been described as calm, kind, and motivated. And my words for Nithya, um, I think you're already so accomplished, so eloquent, and so professional. So, Nithya is actually staying on to volunteer in the lab afterwards, and she's already been in, involved in so many charities. I genuinely cannot believe how much you already do in your spare time to help others. So I'm hoping that one day I see this with your name on it. And without further ado, Nithya. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathia Krishnamurthy, and this summer I interned in the NOMA Center for Immunobiology and Microbial Pathogenesis in the lab of Dr. Janelle Ayers under Dr. Sheila Rao. My project is Superhero Salmonella, in particular, elucidating how Salmonella protein S promotes host health. The principal investigator for my lab is Dr. Janelle Ayers. She received the Young Faculty Award from DARPA in 2015 and was a Searle Scholar in 2014. She revealed an entirely new set of defense mechanisms that will likely lead to novel therapies that bacteria will not be able to evolve resistance to. This is an especially important finding with the rise of superbugs and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Our lab is interested in understanding how microbes promote our health. Humans have trillions of good microbes, which make up our microbiota. Scientists continue to uncover new ways that these good microbes promote our health. But there also exist in the world bad microbes, or pathogens, which cause disease. Our lab takes the unique approach of asking, like good microbes, can pathogens actually promote our health? Though it seems counterintuitive, why would a disease-causing pathogen want to promote our health? Well, pathogens need a place to grow. If they cause so much disease that they kill us, that is bad for the pathogen because it loses its home. Therefore, we propose that bad microbes have evolved ways to promote our health. And to study this, we are looking at the bacterial pathogen Salmonella. Salmonella, no. Salmonella is a good model because it, it lives in our bodies, relies on our nutrients, and needs to be able to go from me to you. Therefore, it is in Salmonella's best interest to keep the host happy. Furthermore, salmonella, salmonella infection is a global health risk. Disease caused by this infection is endemic in Asia, Africa, and South America. And there have been a number of recent high-profile salmonella outbreaks, like the one in Chipotle. So this is an important pathogen to study. So to study this, my mentor infected mice with normal or wild-type salmonella, as well as salmonella deficient in an effector protein S, or mutant salmonella. And she found that 10 days after infection, more mice infected with wild-type salmonella survive as opposed to mice infected with mutant salmonella, indicated by the red line. Interestingly, my mentor also saw that this decreased survival correlates to increased levels of a pro-inflammatory cytokine called IL-1 beta. My mentor then demonstrated that this increased IL-1 beta was bad for the host and contributed to their death by impacting a specific behavioral process. Therefore, our data suggests that this salmonella protein may have evolved to promote host health by limiting the bad cytokine IL-1-beta. I am interested in investigating whether protein S confers an advantage to salmonella. Our data suggests that protein S is doing something to promote host health. As it is in the best interest of the pathogen to keep the host healthy, I wanted to investigate whether wild-type salmonella would outcompete mutant salmonella through a co-infection model. Protein S could confer an advantage through growth or through function by limiting the amount of IL-1 beta that is released, which you just saw is actually bad for the host. 
So to accomplish this, I harvested bone marrow macrophages, which are perfect for infections and testing for IL-1 beta because they are immune cells that express cytokines, and we know that salmonella can replicate in these cells. I harvested bone marrow from mouse, femur, and tibia, and these progenitor cells develop into macrophages with the addition of macrophage stimulating factor. I then infected these macrophages with wild type, mutant, and both strains of salmonella. I analyzed bacterial growth after seven hours of infection through colony forming units. I was especially interested in the co infection cells as I wanted to see how wild type salmonella would outcompete mutant. Before I did the infection, however, I wanted to make sure that these two strains grew similarly in liquid broth with nutrients. I measured optical density growth in wild type and mutant liquid cultures at a few time points as salmonella grows relatively quickly. So if we take a look at this data, we can see that wild type and mutant salmonella grow similarly, corroborating my mentors in vivo data. But what about the co-infection? Is the survival advantage of wild type salmonella tied to growth? Because of this data, I hypothesize that there will be no growth advantage as wild type and mutant salmonella will grow similarly in macrophages. So what about in macrophages? I infected with wild type, mutant, and both strains of salmonella. Wild type and mutant grew well, and perhaps mutant grew a bit less, but importantly, wild type and mutant salmonella grow similarly in a competitive environment, suggesting that wild type does not outcompete mutant in terms of growth. So that poses the question, can wild type salmonella outcompete mutant salmonella in terms of function by inhibiting IL-1 beta levels? As the lab found, increased levels of IL-1 beta in mice infected with mutant salmonella contributes to their increased morbidity. So perhaps protein S evolved to limit IL-1 beta and promote host health. To account for the increased levels of IL-1 beta we saw in the mutant salmonella infected mice, I needed to elucidate how protein S inhibited IL-1 beta secretion. To do so, I needed to look at the inflammasome pathway. So what is the inflammasome pathway? The inflammasomes are multi-protein complexes in a host cell that activate an enzyme called procaspase-1. Procaspase-1 then cleaves itself to produce mature caspase-1. And the mature caspase-1 cleaves pro-IL-1 beta, which is transcribed through an inflammasome-independent pathway. So caspase-1 cleaves pro-IL-1 beta into its mature form, IL-1 beta, which accounts for the secretion we see outside the cell. So we saw increased levels of IL-1 beta in mice infected with mutant salmonella, which suggests that protein, protein S is inhibiting IL-1 beta secretion. But how? There are two options I'm looking into. The first is that there is decreased caspase-1 activity in wild-type salmonella. And the second is that protein S is blocking pro-IL-1 beta transcription. The first thing I wanted to do was to confirm my mentor's data by looking at this extracellular IL-1 beta in the macrophages and looking at IL-1 beta levels in the co-infection. So I performed an ELISA. An ELISA is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. There is a capture antibody to which we add the sample. The target protein binds to the capture antibody. Then there is a detection step. And finally, a substrate is added so we can quantify staining intensity against a standard curve. I predicted that wild-type salmonella is outcompeting mutant salmonella by limiting IL-1 beta, so I would expect to see increased levels in the mutant salmonella and similar levels in the co-infection compared to the wild-type. And that's what I saw. Our preliminary data corroborates our hypothesis that wild-type is functionally outcompeting mutant salmonella in the co-infection. We see more IL-1 beta in cells infected with mutant salmonella, shown in the red bar, and as predicted, the cells infected with both strains are similar to the wild type. So this suggests that protein S is limiting the amount of this extracellular IL-1 beta. But where exactly is protein S functioning along this pathway inside the cell? Interestingly, there is a bacteria called Yersinia, which contains a protein that shares homology to protein S, and that Yersinia protein interacts with this caspase-1. So my hypothesis is that protein S is inhibiting the IL-1 beta secretion by interacting with this caspase-1. Therefore, I predict that mutant salmonella-infected cells will have higher levels of active caspase-1 compared to wild-type levels, and cells infected with both strains will have levels comparable to wild-type if protein S is limiting IL-1 beta by inhibiting caspase-1 activation. However, I'm still working on this experiment. 
But in the meantime, I also wanted to look at this inflammasome independent transcriptional pathway. Can protein S inhibit the transcription of pro IL-1 beta before it is even cleaved? Because of my caspase 1 hypothesis, here I predict that protein S does not impact the transcription of pro IL-1 beta. However, to look into this, I performed a quantitative polymerase chain reaction. We have DNA in our cells, which must be transcribed into mRNA, which is then translated into protein. I isolated RNA from the infected cells and asked how much IL-1 beta was being expressed. The RNA, using reverse transcriptase, was converted to cDNA, which is equivalent to the mRNA in the above image. I wanted to detect the amount of mRNA, and a higher expression would suggest more activation of transcription of that gene. I used a cybergreen assay. Cybergreen is a fluorescent dye that binds to the cDNA. Because of temperature changes, the cDNA template, which is double-stranded, breaks apart and the dye is unbound. Because we are looking at a specific gene, IL-1 beta, if it is present, the DNA is amplified. And since it is double-stranded, the dye will bind to this DNA and we get more and more fluorescence. So we can use this assay to detect transcription of pro-IL-1 beta. And because I hypothesized that protein S interacts with the inflammasome pathway and caspase 1, I would expect to see similar levels of IL-1 beta transcription in all three conditions. However, I saw something different. I saw higher levels of IL-1 beta transcription in the mutant cells, perhaps suggesting that protein S is inhibiting IL-1 beta transcription. But in the co-infection, I saw similar levels of pro-IL-1 beta transcription as compared to the mutant cells. So it is unclear in the co-infection whether wild-type salmonella is outcompeting mutant salmonella functionally by inhibiting IL-1 beta transcription. So I'm repeating this experiment to further elucidate this mechanism. But interestingly, I found that levels of TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a cytokine that is produced independent of the inflammasome pathway, just like the pro IL-1 beta transcriptional pathway, are unaffected. As you can see, levels are similar across wild type, mutant, and co-infected cells. Therefore, it is still possible that protein S is inhibiting IL-1 beta by acting on the inflammasome pathway. So to summarize, we see more IL-1 beta in mutant salmonella extracellularly and this level returns to wild-type levels in the co-infected cells, suggesting that wild-type salmonella outcompetes mutant salmonella by limiting IL-1 beta levels. I hypothesize that this is happening through the inflammasome pathway because of my TNF data, but I'm still working on IL-1 beta mRNA expression and caspase 1 cleavage. So wild-type salmonella functionally outcompetes mutant salmonella. Wild-type and mutant salmonella grow similarly in macrophages, suggesting that there is no growth advantage to wild-type salmonella. IL-1 beta levels are increased in mutant salmonella-infected macrophages and return to wild-type levels in the co-infection. But interestingly, TNF is unaffected, suggesting that protein S is functioning on the inflammasome pathway. Wild-type infected macrophages have less pro-IL-1 beta mRNA expression compared to mutant infected cells, which suggests that protein S could be functioning both on the transcriptional pathway and on the inflammasome pathway. So future directions would be to repeat the qPCR, ELISA, and Western blot to further elucidate this mechanism. I can also use recombinant vectors to see if protein S directly interacts with caspase 1. I can also do this infection in vivo by looking at a co-infection in the mouse model. And I also want to look at mouse models to find out what this extra IL-1 beta means to the host and to see if we can target this pathway for therapies. Our experiment suggests that salmonella has evolved ways to promote parts of its own bacteria that allow it to live in the host and promote host health. The lab found that increased IL-1 beta is detrimental to the host because IL-1 beta acts by inhibiting a specific host behavior. So salmonella has evolved the gene S trait to manipulate that pathway and keep the host healthy. So by studying these microbes, we can actually learn something about our own physiology and processes. This work improves our understanding of how we approach infectious and inflammatory diseases. And instead of considering pathogens as just bad, we can actually use their damage control mechanisms to promote health. Understanding this pathway and these processes could help us lead to new therapies. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Rao, for her patience and guidance, the Heathoff Brody Scholars Program, and the Life Sciences Summer Institute for providing this amazing opportunity to high school students, Ellen, Donna, and Nina from Education Outreach for their support and guidance, Dr. Janelle Ayers for allowing me to work in her lab, and the Ayers Lab for their support. 
my fellow scholars, friends, and family. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs>